Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by Tenable Network Security, the creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center's CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. Larry is teaching SANS wireless 617 ethical, wireless ethical hacking and defense coming up in Las Vegas, Nevada, September 14th through the 9th, 19th, and lots more places. So be certain to check out a SANS website, the SANS website even, not just a <laughs> SANS website, like the SANS. You don't want to go to the other SANS no, websites. It might right. be shady. <laughs> right, right. Go to the SANS website. <laughs> the one and only. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think I need to take a sip of my cocktail after that. Yes. Mm-hmm. I made a, a sidecar. I got my father-in-law addicted to the sidecar drink now. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. What's it made out of? I don't even know. Uh, brandy or cognac. Uh-huh. It's usually like you can – people have different ways. Like, so two ounces, brandy, cognac, an ounce of lemon juice, and an ounce or half an ounce of sweetener, like simple mm. syrup. Okay. Dang. Yeah. Sounds it's pretty good. good. Yeah. Shake it. Shake it good. Right now? Yeah, no, oh, no, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Shake it like a Polaroid picture. Of what? Is that what they say? I think that's what they say. And uh, just serve it in a glass just like that. Kay. Apollo was nice enough to uh, donate these glasses to the studio. Actually, I think he submitted an expense report for them, so they, <laughs> they, really, weren't, they really weren't donated. Uh, I don't know, Chris, we can get, switch to the other <laughs> camera really quick. Uh, but that's this is a proper cocktail glass. I mean, that's just a beautiful cocktail glass. Yeah, that's yeah. the real deal. That's right. the one you want to serve these in. Especially when we're going to talk about hacking team again. Again. And I don't know, did you guys read the security news this week? Did you, if you paid attention at all to security news this week, the big stories were hacking team, like more about hacking team, all kinds of different things about hacking team, and then more things about Adobe Flash zero days. Based on what happened in hacking team. Based on what happened. So really all centers from hacking team. <laughs> hacking team. I, I mean, hacking team even. claims that they were the victim of... Uh, espionage or sabotage from some other country. Yep. That's what they claim. Which is plausible the more I read about it. I had not, I'll be honest, I had not really heard of Hacking Team before this happened. Yeah, you? I didn't either. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I thought it was like the but only it one. Looks like they were quite busy. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I saw today on Twitter. See, I haven't downloaded that stuff because, I mean, that's stolen information. I, I don't want to download it. I hear you. But if somebody tweets a little something, you can read it, it shows up it, in your timeline. It's Twitter. Yeah. Right? It shows up in your timeline. You look at it. And there were some of their proposals that people had put in the timeline, and they were asking for some big bucks for some of their Oh, their hacking zero days. team was commanding some very pretty low, uh, oh, yeah. high rates to do their stuff. Yeah. All their emails are searchable on WikiLeaks. Wow. Not that yeah. I would have oh, read geez. them. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So just, just seeing the, the price lists of some of the malware and some of the zero days that they were peddling, and some of the, um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, again, I've only looked at it via Twitter. I haven't done, you know, uh, any sort of download or comprehensive searches myself, but uh, it's yeah. really quite eye-opening. They, they claim that they were taken out by a government conspiracy. And I think if you were a hacking team in this situation, and I said, well, we got pwned. We got to go publicly and say it was a government conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> like, that should be the most plausible. <laughs> that's the path that's, you got to go down. That's probably your best play. Yeah. Um, it might be true. It, it, yeah. Well, that's why I would say that, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe it was true. Maybe it truly was I don't know. It's the register reporting that, so yeah, yeah. take that for yeah. what it's worth. Um, yeah, and all, as Chris said, all their uh, emails from WikiLeaks. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I also read that the third hacking team flash zero day was found. Yeah. That, and that was Brian Krebs reporting, so that is likely to be true. Yeah. <laughs> He's an awesome journalist. So, I mean, I can't even wrap. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around what has happened recently, not just with the hacking team, but uncovering the Adobe Zero Day, and then I don't know if Adobe patched the first one and didn't patch the second one, or if they did patch the one that came out, and then Firefox says, well, here's an update for Firefox, and by the way, in this update, if you're not running the latest Adobe Flash player, we're going to block all Flash from within the browser. It, 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 it to almost, have that happen, I think that is just one of the... 
I mean, we talk about all these vulnerabilities that have big names. I think that one act right there in the whole story surrounding this is like the news of the year. I'm just, I'm floored. It's pretty by huge. This. It's almost I'm like floored. Flash is unraveling right yes. underneath us. I saw lots of tweets, people saying, you know, Steve Jobs was right. Aren't you happy that, you know, your yes. iOS device can't run Flash? Mm -hmm. um, Flash might, and I'm using might, emphasizing mm -hmm. it, might have been a fine technology 10 years ago, but mm. golly, what a mess. What a mess. Well, I mean, the fact that it has to run software on top of your browser is, I think, one of the things that's killing it. On top of that, it's software that has lots of security holes. Yep. On top of that, it's not something that everyone needs today. I think you can get by today without Flash. Yep. Um, it has a just unbelievable number of vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And for the browsers now to start doing stuff that blocks so-called bad things, and that bad thing is being labeled as Adobe Flash. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, it is worth saying, you know, Jobs hated it for many reasons. It, it sucked too much power yep. out of the phone, slow. and this, it was slow, and, and he wanted to push newer technologies, mm -hmm. HTML5 and everything. Um, it would be nice to see the fairly rapid dissipation of Flash and its replacement with other things. That is the only way to get it out of there, right? Yeah. Is if it just doesn't work anymore, if it's blocked by the browser. Otherwise, you know, legacy systems limp on forever. So <clears throat> one of the major security differences between Flash and HTML5, HTML5 is more reliant on the server side of things and less reliant on the client. I think it's the, the big... It certainly can be. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, that's not to say that the HTML5 is perfect. No. Obviously, there could be vulnerabilities in... Well, really, JavaScript and the web application at that point. Sure. Um, and, yep. Yeah, yeah, and the implementation uh, within the browser of how it deals with all the complexity of HTML5. Yes. So there's probably yes. going to be a lot of discoveries in that, too. Um, exciting times. Right? I trust my browser more than I trust Adobe to make a secure Flash plugin. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's really Amen. what it boils down yeah, to. Yeah. Uh, got, uh, so one person, I, it, was, it was an ISC post that posed a question of, so what's next? Like, they said and quoted some statistics, and I, I don't have them in front of me right now, but that exploit kits are largely using Adobe Flash. And what happens when all these browsers start to say, okay, we're going to block Flash by default, make you enable it, let's say. And let's say Flash starts to fall off from existence. Where will attackers turn to then build their exploit kits? What, what zero days will we see in the next hacking team? So, well, I mean... Java? Are they going to go back to Java? So, so, you know, Java has had its issues. It had mm -hmm. you know, bad years a couple years ago. I think they've tried to clean it up. They might find fertile hunting grounds there. Um, right now, it's kind of like Java's more like a fine wine. It's having a good year. Well, it's previous compa years but by comparison. By, by comparison, comparison only. Okay. It's just it's so better than previous Flash, year. you know, there's, there's PDF. And then I think, you know, other document rendering applications um, would be interesting hunting grounds for them mm -hmm. to look into. But it is, I mean, yes, there's always going to be uh, some zero day found in the browser itself. Mm -hmm. um, but those helper applications, because they're run by other uh, companies, they're built by other companies mm -hmm. that often don't have the exposure to different security attacks that the browser vendors have, I think it's in those helper, those separate applications that we're going to see a lot of that stuff, especially if it's rendering documents because of all the parsing necessary. Yes, that's a good point, though. It's yeah. stuff that needs to render or parse that has these heinous vulnerabilities usually. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you know I, think, I think Ed said it before as well with HTML5 and the explosion of functionality in HTML5. Um, we, we've got a whole lot of research that hasn't been done there um, yet, and we will, see, uh, we will see vulnerabilities come out of the uh, HTML5 space as well, I think. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. It's the, you know, the, any, any rendering uh, plug-in kind of functionality as well as the... Uh, the uh, amount of diversity and, and uh, explosion of functionality in HTML5. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Bo, what do you think? Is this the end of Flash as we know it today? I don't know if it's the end of Flash. I mean, it's, it's so widely used that I think that it's probably going to live, you know, a pretty hefty lifetime for a while. But, yeah. I mean, it's something that, you know, we're going to drive towards killing as security professionals, but it's not going to die. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you find websites all the time that use freaking clear text authentication. And it's mm -hmm. like... <laughs> Why it, is if, that even a thing? <laughs> if you were in, in charge of Bo, if you were in charge of security for an enterprise, and you were making the decision to remove Flash, uh, what, what would be your? Would that be a recommendation or not? Or would it depend on the circumstances? 
you, you know, I mean, with, with an organization, I mean, you have so many needs for different departments of an organization. People all the time within an organization have different sites or websites they need to uh, utilize to do their job. I mean, mm. you, have, you have various sites that, you know, have to have Flash to, to even function. So, I mean, if, if you have, you know, a limitation, like, I, I mean, personally, I would say, yeah, let's kill it. But, you know, you have those occasional needs within an organization that have to be met in order to even do business. So, um, it's tough. It's, 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 it's a tough challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it comes down to a lot of separation. Like, if I were thinking about it, chances are you're probably not accessing a cloud application that needs Flash. Most cloud applications that I use, software as a service, if they used Flash at one point in time, have migrated away from that in favor of HTML5 or server-side mm -hmm. Java or something else. True. Sure. Um, .NET even. And when you access a Flash application, oftentimes it's for an internal usage. Some device, some legacy application has implemented something in Flash. Mm -hmm. And it, not that it's bad. I mean, Nessus used to have a Flash interface. Yeah. I really liked the Flash interface the in Nessus. the best Flash interface I saw. Yeah, really. It was great, it was right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there are other things that have implemented Flash interfaces that have been really good. So it's not that it's bad. It's, I think now, though, it's more internal facing applications rather than ones that are out there on the internet. Right. So now you have to make the decision of, well, uh, and do the policing of, well, if you're going to access Flash, it has to be on an internal address. And if you're going out to the internet, we need to block Flash when you're sure. going out to the internet kind of thing. Right. That's how I would start And there's some stuff you could it. do. You could, I mean, this is, this is kind of ugly, but not too bad. You could have two separate browsers. And yeah. say, look, you have to use this browser to go to the internet applications. And if you use the other browser to try to go to them, it won't let you in. Yeah, um, do the policing on the host. That's, a, that's an interesting point. Because yeah. then if it's a laptop and they take that somewhere else, that... Policing still applies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, well, that's that's. I see a lot of interesting endpoint technologies. Yeah. Mm. But I'm on the fence about a lot of them, but I think that security in the endpoint is really kind of where it's at now. Well, with yeah, with all the encryption and in you know an increase in the diversity of endpoints, um, yeah, I think we got to have really good solid security on them. Except so. if you're running Windows XP, which no longer <laughs> yeah. gets security patches. Yeah. 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 Do you guys do pen tests? Do you see Windows XP a lot out there still? I wouldn't say a lot. I would say it. I would say it. You say it a lot? We still, we yeah, still yeah. see it. We still see it, but I, I think it, um, you probably, probably Win 7 is much more common now. Exactly. Win 7. Yeah, it's, it's much uh, more common, but it's still out there. It's you do see occasional XP. And the other thing is XP is, is throughout a lot of the um, utility companies and infrastructure stuff. So, like in Cyber oh, City, yes. in Cyber City, we got a lot of XP because, well, that's that's the real world. Um, but if you know, when I look in banks, um, even a lot of the hospitals, which have been lagging, I see hospitals now moving up to uh, uh, Windows Seven, which I think is very good as opposed. Yeah, to that, that that's just actually a good comment, um, Ed, because I've done we've done a couple of SCADA things, and um, in the embedded controllers, XP is often there. Yep. Um, and often there without any patches. I mean, like. Like not even service pack one, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a scary world. But. I have heard in some medical environments. I mean, while the the sort of uh, you know paper pushing stuff has gone to Windows Seven, but a lot of the stuff that controls the medical devices themselves uh, is still XP, which is a concern. So yep. and I and I found that in the university world as well. Actually, a lot of these um, um, scanning electron microscopes and things like that had oh, like yeah. had an embedded like NT box in them or. Yeah. An embedded XP box, and it was like, whoa! And 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 then you go to them and go, hey guys, you can't do this. This thing is vulnerable to all sorts of stuff. And they're like, well, we can't upgrade it. We're yeah. tied to the manufacturer. You know, we're tied to this this vendor. And like, oh, okay, so right. yeah, big problems. Um, so this article says that the U.S. Navy extended their support contract with Microsoft, and Microsoft is supporting Windows XP for them until 2017. Yeah. Yeah. Is that true? I heard that, yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's pretty amazing. It, but for everyone else, so like the Navy gets XP updates and no one else does? Well, other people can pay for it. You and pay you, have pay for it. Yeah. you have to pay for it. You have to pay for it. A whole bunch of money. I got you. Yeah. What and about the, uh, the ATM machines? Yeah. Those were running XP for a while. I wonder if the banks are going to pay for that extended. Yeah. I just don't know. I haven't heard. There was, a, there was an article that said that you could edit certain registry keys to make your XP machine look like one of those embedded systems. 
to continue to get I patches. I saw that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that is not so, operating within the license, <laughs> right? I'm <laughs> sure it's not. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Microsoft might catch, catch on to that. Now, now, on the hacking team thing, though, mm. um, you know, what, what should you take away from that as oh, sort of like lots the, of things. Well, I mean, yeah, so the lesson, you know, there's something that, that, that we talk about all the time. I'm sure you've heard it. It's when you're, when you're making a business decision and you're not sure of the ethics of what you're about to do, would you be comfortable if it was written up on the front page of the New York Times? Mm -hmm. And that's helped guided some of the business decisions I've made, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's helped me to, to think through them. But, you know, it does occur to me that there are certain businesses, you know, maybe military stuff, where there's there's no happy answer there. I'm not saying that hacking team made the right decision by mm -hmm. any means, but I, I'm saying the simplicity simplicity of of this notion of hey, if it's in the newspaper, would would you feel okay with it? That served me well in my career, mm -hmm. but I can imagine there are people in jobs where that if you could go A or B, both of them would be bad, and there's no C. Mm. So I mean, what do you do when you get into this this situation where somebody's offering you to do business? You have to discern whether they are legitimate, whether they're evil. I mean, it, it, we can look at hacking team and say, yeah, they made some bad calls. But uh, has this ever come up in your, your oh, work? Or, yeah, yeah. All, all the time. All yeah. the time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and then how, what is your decision-making process? Is it the, hey, if I'm published in the newspaper, I'll still be able to nod my head and say, yeah, I did business with those folks? I, uh, I think that's a very, it's a good analytical uh, approach. Um, I tend to kind of go with my gut, mm -hmm. and usually my gut tells me that I wouldn't want this on the front page of the, <laughs> right, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, I mean, you can tell from your gut. I mean, you know. And oftentimes, if you're questioning it... Then it's probably the answer is no. Then it's probably the answer is no, don't do it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, that's a good answer, Paul. I was about to say the same thing. Your gut instinct is going to tell you, yeah. you know, this is, this is not right. It doesn't feel right. Um, and you know that that's a that's a good thing. I, I like what you said though, Ed. I think the front page of the newspaper is a, a nice metric to do that like first thought analysis thing. Like that that's that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, just to just kind of go through that. Yeah. Do I really want this to be on you know whatever it is, TV, New York Times, what, what whatever it might be. And I think it's important for us as security professionals to think through that as we make decisions of of where we're going to work, how we're going to work, and who we're going to do business with. Um, it's very easy to throw stones at hacking team and say, wow, they were doing business with some pretty unsavory people. Um, but I, I hope that we learn a lesson from that and it, it chastens us to, to make us more careful and uh, to make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, speaking of, you know, we're talking about XP, I want to talk about the polar opposite of, of XP and talk about Windows 10. Mm -hmm. Apparently, non-enterprise versions of Windows 10 will get software updates and the user will not be able to stop them. Yeah. I, mm. I, I remember it was years ago, Marcus Raynham had yes. something interesting to say to that. And it was, it was, I think it was in he the- He hates that. Well, but here's what he said. Uh, I, I, I remember it well, because I was kind of surprised to see him write this. But it was, I think when Microsoft originally was turning on automatic updates for Windows XP. Yeah. And it was still opt in or opt out, right? Mm -hmm. So users could do that. But Marcus, before that time, had always said, if you're running a computer, you have a responsibility to patch it, and you've got to keep it up to date, and mm -hmm. you've got to keep it secure. Then Microsoft did that, and Marcus you know, wrote a little paragraph about this, and I was surprised to see him write it. But he says, look, I hate this idea, but it seems to me either Microsoft is going to control those computer systems mm -hmm. or criminals are going to control the computer systems. Yeah, yeah. But for the average user... There isn't an option for them to control their computers. So mm -hmm. it's going to be Microsoft or the criminals, and Microsoft is choosing that it will be them. And it seems to me it's chosen that it'll be them. And it seems to me it's even more that case now with the Windows 10 mm -hmm. no opt-out. Right. right. But, yeah, when I saw that, I thought, hey, that's, that's what Marcus Raynham was talking about eight years ago or whatever it was. It's interesting how the yeah. luminaries like Marcus will Indeed. predict things like that. Um, <laughs> for me, it's, I, it's kind of a, it's a I, I'm struggling with it, right? I mean, if it's my personal system, or even better, if it's my grandmother's computer at home, probably okay. I don't have a huge issue with it. So, so However, Paul, you know, I want to I, I ask you a question, Paul, mm -hmm. about that particular issue, because um, you have a university background like, like I do mm -hmm. uh, in, in your professional career, and I had situations back in the XP days where I had faculty that were running very, very long 
um, processing statistical jobs. You know, they would run for two, three weeks, okay, and some even longer. And they started getting really, really angry about automatic updating because well yeah i mean the answer to that is use linux so (laughs) (laughs) well well, right but but that actually (laughs) illustrates the point that somebody else is actually taking control of my system doing an automatic update Mm -hmm. and interrupting a critical processing task with maybe 10 years of research behind it well i wonder if they're going to force you are they going to force you to reboot or do you still have some control over when you reboot they haven't said so because right now like uh you have control over when it reboots if you've applied the patches Mm -hmm. they're like hey if you don't respond to this, we're going to reboot. And if you say no, don't don't restart now. Yeah. So if you're actively using the computer, I, you I was control obviously it. making that assumption. Yeah, that I think they have to <laughs> give you that ability, or else really bad things could happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And now I think it's interesting is we have two machines, Windows machines here in studio that run Skype. Now, there are um, there's a graphics card that feeds two different video feeds, and there's a USB uh, webcam. There's a USB audio device uh, attached to it. If an update breaks any one of those devices, that machine's useless mm. to us during the show. So, mm. you know, if it's right before the show, are we going to apply a Windows update? Probably we're going to wait two hours before, mm-hmm. we, <laughs> before we apply that update sure. so that we don't break any of our devices. So that puts people in some interesting positions. If this is the way Windows 10 is going to go, my next updates to the machines that run Skype for the studio are going to be Macs. I right. mean, that's just the way it has to go. Or, you know, Microsoft might respond saying, well, you're obviously not interested in consumer grade stuff you should be going for the professional stuff where you can control that yeah, yeah exactly go buy the enterprise license that's probably it, it yeah. costs more of course it, right yeah probably costs the same as i can go buy a mac yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> linux yeah, I mean, is an interesting choice because you have a lot of device driver issues oh. with linux to do that and oh, that, yeah. that's not a viable option for that particular use case yeah, not when you got a lot of fancy hardware yeah. and such yeah yeah but so, you can see uh, I, i'm not it's, a it's an issue of trust for it's an issue of trust ultimately i think yeah. Right, because what you're saying is, by any automated update situation, is I trust you that your your update is not going to break what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. That that's the statement, and you should have, in my opinion, a little bit of control over that. If you're not having any control over that, then then your trust is your trust is absolute by by not your choice. Right. And. You know, I'm not a sycophant for Microsoft, but I think Microsoft is stating that it doesn't believe that its consumer-grade customers can in any way secure themselves, and that's why they're doing this. That is the that is the end end game story. I think you're right. They're they're stating that look, consumers just just cannot have that responsibility. Uh, At least they have that delineation. I mean, so so what happens the first time Microsoft? Screws this up. I mean, it's going to happen. It's inevitable, right? They're going to push something that will break a lot of things. Obviously, the licenses are going to be written, so they absolve themselves of responsibility. But, but the public backlash is going to be vicious. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's scary for them from a business perspective, I think. Um, yeah. uh, anyway. Speaking of public backlash, Apple is thinking about showing people ads based on their bank account balances. Because mm-hmm. now you've got an Apple Pay, Ooh. conceivably. Wow. Or if Apple... I don't know how an Apple Pay is just your credit card, right? It's not your... Like maybe if it's your debit card, they could get access to it. I don't know. I don't. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And that's really a thing. I hadn't seen that. Wow. This is thing. They said they're thinking about it. This is from Gizmodo. That's creepy. It's very creepy. Yeah, that's that's like George Orwell stuff, right? I I don't like that at all. Um, You know, 1984. He was a little off on the years, but um, yeah, yeah. I don't like that. I wonder if this is like remember remember back? It was actually just a couple years ago where if you would surf to like an airline website and you'd be coming from Safari on a Mac, mm-hmm. the airline tickets would cost more. Do you remember that? They, they look at the, the user agent string. That's why Safari, you can switch your user agent string to make it IE or Chrome or whatever, mm-hmm. is because the retailers, especially the airlines, but others, were pushing back different prices because they figured if you're going to spend the extra money for a Mac and Whoa, run Safari, you clearly have more money to spend, so we're going to charge you more. I mean, this was a, this was a story a couple years ago. Maybe this is Apple's strike back on that, right? They're like, yeah. okay, we know exactly how much money you have. And, and, yeah, that's yeah. revenge. Yeah, it's the revenge of Apple. Oh, so boy. they're going to take those airlines and not advertise tickets. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. yeah. You can only fly Southwest. That's <laughs> yeah. it. That's all the money you have in your bank account. The only thing you can afford is Southwest. I suppose worse things could happen. This is true. <laughs> I, I, I fly Southwest all exactly. the time. Exactly. Southwest the only isn't so bad. That, yeah, yeah. I don't want to name some of the worst options. but Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, what else we got? Um, 
uh, authentication bypass bug. Uh, encrypted. Oh, encrypted web and Wi-Fi at risk. His RC4 attacks become more practical. That is uh, a really interesting, interesting story. I knew yeah. you love encryption I, I and do. decryption. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't hold a candle to Josh Wright on yeah, the crypto he stuff. Is That's very his thing. He loves math. That you he like you math. you love math too, but Josh Josh really loves that's math. His thing. Yeah, that's his thing. But yeah, this no more RC four thing. Um, You're very scary. Yeah, uh, they haven't published the technical details, but they kind of give you an idea of what mm -hmm. their attack is about. Um, and it's RC four when used as a cipher for um, SSL or TLS, as well as they hit at using it for things like uh, WPA WPA two mm -hmm. with TKIP. Um, it looks pretty darn interesting. I mean, it's still, it, it, the, the article talks about taking 75 hours, and you're going to have to stream traffic for that 75 hours to get enough and then, and then crack it. But it's a lot more practical than it used to be. It used to be hundreds or thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. Now down to 75 hours, maybe even less. Is that based on, in the stream, depending on how you configure it, is there clear text mixed with ciphertext? text? In no, that, it's, it's all ciphertext. It's, it's all ciphertext. But the idea is you get a JavaScript running in somebody's browser. Mm -hmm. That JavaScript starts sending messages to the site where um, you've got some sort of maybe cookie that that mm -hmm. site has pushed there. So, so the concept here is imagine Dakota has some website and he's pushed a cookie back to you. I get a, a JavaScript to run in your browser because maybe you surf to my site or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, that JavaScript running in your browser starts sending a whole bunch of data to oh, him, okay. sending the cookie again and again, but I'm sniffing that data. Mm -hmm. And then okay. over time, I can then crack the RC4 that is protecting that. Because I have enough ciphertext yes, to make exactly. their Yes, exactly. And the JavaScript yeah. is generating that stuff, shooting it out. I gotcha. Um, they haven't published the details doesn't, of it. but Doesn't same origin policy apply there or no? Because it's a cookie, I can... Well, the well you're sending the cookie just to, to the site that set the cookie for you. Oh, it's the so it doesn't bypass the same origin policy. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Although yeah. you, do, you do, do still have to be able to sniff the traffic, right? You so do have to be able to sniff the traffic. complication there. Yep, you do have to sniff the traffic, but, you know, if you're a government... Right, and you, and you run the ISP, or if you have implants in right. the ISPs, um, yeah. But you do have to sniff the traffic. That is a requirement for it. Interesting. But I, I, I thought it was particularly interesting and clever. I think they're going to release the details at Black Hat or DEF CON coming mm -hmm. up. Um, but it is definitely worth a read. So very cool. Uh, and anything else you guys want to talk about, Joff? How about your story? Oh wait, wait, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Paul. You know I'm. Terrible, terrible, terrible. I've been uh, busy writing code again this week, so what can I say? That's your excuse, That's isn't it? That's yeah. his excuse all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been busy doing nothing. No, I mean writing code. So it's interesting. There's a, in, uh, The last one I had in there is uh, an energy automation system from Siemens has a uh, authentication bypass vulnerability. We see this all the time in embedded systems. You kind of hinted towards... IOT and, and problems there. Yep, yep. And we've talked about it at nauseum on the show. <laughs> so much so that we had to give it a break for a while. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's just so frustrating to still see these issues. And, you know, you were talking before about, uh, you said something before that was interesting, that the same types of issues that you see in IOT and consumer gear can exist in military-grade weapon systems. That's right. Yeah. It's the same thing here. We see wireless home routers that have authentication bypass vulnerabilities. Yep. Those vulnerabilities translate over to a Siemens energy automation device. That's Conceivably, right. could be used in a nuclear power plant. Yep. Then we see Billy Rios writing about authentication bypass vulnerabilities on IV pumps. So and these are all embedded systems. Yeah. And we're not even talking about the full IoT picture so here, right? This is this is in the firmware. And I think it's I think it's two things. One is they're making the same mistakes. So it's different yes. developers making the same mistakes. And in some cases they're using the same code. So it's the same mistake, just replicated. Because there's lots of code reuse in firmware because in, in it's, everything. Yeah, because in it's every, available. Right? It's really yeah. hard I to mean, think of, dude, you know, it's really hard to run it yourself because it's in a small space. Yeah. It's very special purpose. So if someone solved that problem, I feel like code reuse is so much higher. Exactly. In an embedded system than so, other things. So I've, I've been thinking about this, this idea. Um, you know how they say, don't implement your own cryptography? Yes. Right? I mean, if, if, if you're First wise, thing. you won't do your own cryptography. You'll get cryptography from somebody who's very smart, and mm -hmm. you'll use theirs. Maybe developers shouldn't implement their own authentication. Because um, mm. doing authentication right appears to be very hard. It doesn't seem like it would be. How mm -hmm. hard could it be? You ask them for a user ID and password. Do it across an encrypted channel. What could go wrong? Well, as we've seen, all kinds of things can go wrong. So maybe 
it's a it's a bit of wisdom to not implement your own authentication. Now, don't just grab whatever was built into the embedded firmware, but instead find an authentication system that has been vetted and tested. The, the problem is someone will do that and then build a back door into that yeah, and then true. everyone that's will true. reuse yeah. it. <laughs> or somebody will do some really cutting edge <coughs> research, find a flaw in a very widely used authentication system yeah. and then break that open. But I mean, there's stuff like OAuth and other mm -hmm. widespread authentication systems out there. I think we as an industry need to learn from them and then to use various you know, pieces of code, just like we do for crypto. Mm -hmm. Anybody who builds their own crypto that isn't a genius and very skilled in building their own crypto is kind of nuts. Um, maybe the same thing needs to apply to authentication. You know, Gen I think genius that's and nuts often go hand that's in true. hand. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that, that was actually a good meeting. Me, me, uh, Ed said that, but I think that's actually a good point. Um, however, the risk is, and Ed, you pointed it out, is when it is uh, vulnerable, it is researched and vulnerable in such a widespread system, then everybody get, goes down at once, right? And the, the impact is much, much wider, much broader. Um, but I think in many ways it's worth that risk because uh, systems that have gone through time-tested um, uh, analysis that have gone through, like, like advanced crypto systems, gone through a lot of rigorous mathematical proof kind of work, a lot of, lot of examination in the industry, um, you've got to think they're going to do better yeah. than, than your homegrown authentication system. And I, I think it's good for us as an industry if we, if we send the message, rolling your own authentication is dangerous, mm -hmm. at a bare minimum. It's dangerous. Well, we had, this, uh, we had this discussion a couple of weeks ago, right? It was about rolling your own password manager. It was the same kind of discussion. Uh, it was like, you know, why would you do this? Well, you know, we talked about it. It's like, well, yeah, you might want to do it on your own for like alpha level code with a little toy that, that only you use and you don't use it across platforms and you don't, you know. But would you really want to scale that up and turn it into like a cloud-based solution and uh, turn it into something that, that, that all your buddies can use and then turn it into an open source project and then eventually you get to the point of you're growing this into a a common standard, right? Yeah. And that and that's and that's the point you get to. With with uh, an authentication system like OAuth, um, people have done a lot of work on it. It's a good common standard. Maybe we should start adopting. You know. So I feel so preachy right there. Okay, I'll stop. You were very <laughs> preachy, Josh. Preachy, yes. brother. Preachy. Yeah. I guess that's the classic trade-off, right? It's between sort of centralizing it in one person who theoretically does a really good job. But if they don't, then you've got widespread problems versus everybody does it themselves. Like, who knows how well they do it? But at least if something fails, it only fails in one spot, right? Right. Well, that's how I feel somewhat embedded systems are right now is I can make heinous authentication mistakes. And it probably only affects my device and my firmware, which maybe is only like a small piece of that. It might in the, be. In the next revision of the hardware, it completely changed. So I had to change the firmware and yeah. I used different authentication. So what I think we're, we're feeling now is death by a thousand cuts. Yes. And that hurts. I mean, still death. But the concern is if we didn't have a thousand cuts, we might have somebody just slice us in half. Mm -hmm. One cut yeah. and right. you're still cut in half. Right. Um, I think um, having all these uh, homegrown roll your own solutions is is detrimental. And it would be nice to see a narrower mm -hmm. thing. Uh, Diversity is important when it comes to technological solutions, you mm -hmm. know. But we don't want to have the monoculture. Remember, Dan Gear wrote about I the do, monoculture I do. I years was just ago. Mention, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but I think we've erred uh, away from uh, monoculture, at least in the embedded space. There's just too much too stuff. Many, too yeah. many people rolling their own. I want to see a secure web framework for embedded systems. I feel like a lot of the vulnerabilities are due to web application vulnerabilities of managing the device itself. Never mind yeah. the web application ish protocols they use to communicate, but to manage the device itself. We've seen a Thousands and yeah. thousands of vulnerabilities. Yeah, it's, it, it's amazing how many times in, in the pen tests that we do that we come across session management issues yeah. with, with uh, authentication authorization systems. What? Everybody, you would think, knows how to do this now, right? I guess that illustrates the point, obviously. Yeah. It's like, we, and we write about it, and it's almost like there should be an RFC branded to some, some development groups, like tail ends. You know? <laughs> like, you need to do this. This is the right way to do it. And, and I've written that report, I don't know, countless times. Yeah. This yeah. is the right way to do session management. But another, another related thing 
on the on the embedded side mm -hmm. is how do you do updates, firmware updates? Yeah, I've yeah. talked about in, that in a consistent a and secure fashion because all these different vendors are kind of rolling their own. I'd like to think some of them are pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure some of them are really horrible and allow you to, be, you know, while it's updating across the the web, going you know typically to a cloud-based service, somebody could inject some code in there. Yeah, most of them don't do any kind of validation of. Uh, that the firmware is first valid. Like right. they don't even produce an MD5 checksum a lot of times. Yeah. They don't do any validation that the firmware you're installing is actually from the manufacturer. Whether you're going to download the firmware or whether the firmware updates are automatic, most vendors don't check anything. And most vendors aren't encrypting their firmware to prevent any kind of reverse engineering either, which it, I mean is yeah. a layer, but it, it I, seems to me, and I'm not so worried about the reverse engineering, I'm worried about people inserting malware in yeah. there. And uh, it seems to me that there's a business model there that somebody, given that the Internet of Things is rising and there's all these little devices, garage door openers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, things that can I have one of those, dude. It's awesome. Cool. People cool. are like, I'm like <laughs> opening my garage my phone. People are like, did you just open your garage door from your phone? I'm like, yes, Darn right, I, I did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it seems to me there's got to be a, a, a vendor that could, that could create a secure way for other vendors to update their firmware for Internet of Things, and that would be their business model. So you you know you say to a little vendor that's creating mm -hmm. some really cool new I don't know you know lava oh, lamp or eco something. Eco vent, right? They make automatically opening and closing vents yeah. for geoforced hot air and uh, sure. at home. Yep, sure. yeah. yeah. So you know that one yeah. room in your house right. is extremely cold all the time, no matter what season it is, and the other room in your house is like smoking hot all yeah. the time. Yeah. Because it's just not balanced. So they, you replace all of your vents with eco vents. They talk to each other over Zigbee, and they oh, nice. automatically open and close so that it heats yeah, and cools cool. the house evenly. But, but should that company? So like, have are they to concerned about security? Right. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. And should they have to make their own update stuff? Because maybe the firmware gets updated across the internet. Yeah. It yeah. Often yeah. does. Um, or just say, hey, you pay us some money, we'll solve that problem for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's good. that's a really good point, Ed. I mean, there, there's a definite opportunity there um, to in. Re invent a model for these small Internet of Things devices just kind of similar to what Microsoft did with their auto-update technology. Bring that out, tell these guys, you know, come to us, we'll, we'll do your, your firmware signature verification, maybe signed, um, you know, certificate-based, PKI, whatever, and we will deliver your stuff. Yeah. Uh, that, would be, that would be pretty cool. Of course, then, you know, tied into the Windows 10 story we talked about earlier, and when this company, yes. this theoretical yeah. company, pushes a bunch of bad firmware and your house gets hot again, yeah. you're going to be really upset. Yeah. Um, well, the dangerous part about pushing firmware is you're pushing the OS, yeah. the kernel, the yeah. file system, you all in one it. shot. You have like way more higher chance of breaking it yeah. than you do with just even an operating system patch, Yeah, which is scary. Scary times. Yes. I, I've having bricked many different embedded systems in my time. <laughs> I know that firmware oh, updates yeah. can be. Yeah. yeah what, what happens when an, an entire company bricks everything they've ever deployed in one go? Yikes! Yeah. So they go out of business. That's pretty yeah. simple. <laughs> well, yeah. They push out a firmware update in a geographic region that is having a lightning storm. If you lose power during a firmware update. You only get half your kernel. Yeah, that's bad don't. because now <laughs> the system doesn't boot at yeah, all. Don't ever boot. That's why they yeah. call it a brick because yeah. you use it to prop yeah. the door open afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's heavy enough for that. Now, yeah. Some of these new internet things are really tall, They're too small. Light. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you might use them to I don't know we decorations or but. lighter doors. Yeah, jewelry. Yeah, very yeah. small doors. Jewelry. Yeah, Christmas tree ornaments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Christmas yeah. Tree ornaments. Hey, why do you have a drop cam? Oh, it's brick. Yeah. I'm just using this Christmas tree <laughs> ornament. <laughs> why, why is that box with blinky lights hanging? <laughs> we should do that. We should get a Christmas tree. You know, maybe this year, and just put a whole bunch of brick stuff on it, and that would be the entire decoration for I, it. I, you know, right. I yeah. could donate a lot of decorations. <laughs> you could decorate. You yeah. could decorate yeah. the yeah. studio that yes. way. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> be fabulous. That would be beautiful. <laughs> uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about? No. Well, uh, Joff, as always, thank you. Uh, Bo and Dakota, thank you for uh, donating your time to, to help out with Security Weekly. Ed Scotus, of course, wonderful having you in studio, live in the flesh. It's good seeing you, my friend. As it were. Thank you so much. I love that word, flesh. It well, sounds, it's almost like moist. It kind of sounds, hot it's here, hot in it? here, yeah. so I'm kind of, yeah. my flesh <laughs> is kind of moist. It's very fleshy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for watching. We'll see everyone next week on Security Weekly. Over and out.